Uh, what the way we I want to introduce today, it's you may or may not have heard me speak on a regular weekly basis on a program talk show connected with the University of Acadia. And one of the things that I've been reminded as I've been going through this information is A, <laughs> there's too much of it, uh, B, uh, what about the basics and, and getting a sense of how everything fits together. Uh, by that I mean getting a framework. It's fine to talk about the general executor, it's fine to talk about documents, it's, it's fine to talk about uh, conduct in court or responses or any kind of remedy, but I feel one of the things that has been missing is what we're about to go through now, uh, a framework where you can maybe hopefully put some context in on some of the things you've heard from me and other things you know. So the first session is Western Roman law. So the first thing I want to say is <laughs> nothing you're going to hear is legal advice. And the reason it's not legal advice uh, is what these words mean when we hear the words attorney, barrister in a moment, lawyer and the art. I want to start here because frequently you hear when people talk on radio or they speak about the law, they say, oh, I'm not, it's not legal advice. Let, let's start because this is actually very interesting as to the origin of these words. Attorney. The word attorney, attunement from the 16th century, combined with the Latin word at, to, and torno, turn, round off, means to consent implicitly or explicitly to a transfer of right. In other words, the attorney is there to prove that you have given up your rights. So I'm definitely not here to get you to give up your rights. I'm not an attorney. What about a barrister? The word barrister is from the late 16th century combined with the Latin word barro, which means dunce, incompetent, sto or stare, to stand firm, to be in position. So barrister means literally to stand, represent a dunce or an incompetent. Well, I'm not here to stand before you and accuse any of you of being dunce or incompetent, so I'm certainly not a barrister. Uh, am I a lawyer? Well, the word lawyer is from the 16th century, combining the Latin word la or lares, customary law, and luro, lurare, to swear, take an oath, to conspire, meaning literally one who has sworn an oath to customary law of the private guilt. In other words, sworn an oath to lie. That's a lawyer. A lawyer is one who has sworn an oath to lie, a pathological liar. That's their sworn oath. Well, I'm not here to be a pathological liar. I'm certainly not a lawyer. And just in case, just in case there's any misunderstanding, the art of law, am I practising law? In the 13th century in Florence, the Medici organised merchants into private systems of five major guilds called the Arti Mediane and seven minor guilds called the Arti Minor, occult guilds called the Arti, hence the art of law. Well, I'm not here to practise occult before you and I certainly don't belong to an occult guild. So I'm certainly not practising the art or claiming to practise the art. And last one, if you have a legal problem, find a competent advocate, definitely not an attorney, lawyer or barrister, <laughs> OK? This is not about getting around the law, and I want to step on this one for a moment too. Today is about expressing knowledge on the rule of law, equity of law and fairness of law. It's your choice to claim the status, if you suffer a problem, to choose to remain to be in the role of victim, which they want you to be, or to be accountable and competent for your own actions. And I say that because, again, what one of the, the many things that you hear, people almost selling remedy, buy my remedy, as if there is no consequence for where you are. You'll find in a moment it's actually about who we are first, what we are first, that makes everything we'll talk about make sense. Thanks, Anastasia. So what is competence? You may have heard me say this word over and over again on the talk shoes. And competence, I'm sorry for the amount of words. <laughs> you can tell it's UK to by the amount of words. <laughs> competence uh, is a fictional concept of being fit, proper and qualified to produce and argue reason through knowledge and skill of law, logic and rhetoric against arguments. So competence is about knowing information and knowing how to use it. 
those two key things, knowing something and knowing how to use it. We say, and these are references to canon, that's actually canon 2600 of the canon law of Eucadia. By the way, these are, these are handouts that you'll get at the end, so you don't have to if you don't want to, you don't have to write this, you'll get them in handouts as slides. Your divine person or soul is always competent. We always say this, always say this. If your soul, your essence, and people have different words for it, so I'm not going to label it as, as one particular label, but if that thing which is divine of you is from the greater divine, how could it be incompetent? How could it be? can't be. So we always say that your soul, your spirit, that essence of, of you, that immortal part of you, can't be incompetent. However, your true person, your flesh and mind, may or may not be incompetent. I've been tricked, you might have been tricked, you might have believed someone, you might have felt the angst when someone you believed was trustworthy turned out to be untrustworthy. It's part of life. We, and so competence in terms of flesh and mind can be tricked. And in fact, in essence, that is the key to the whole Roman system. It's about tricking our minds. It's about convincing us we're less, it's about convincing us that we are mortal animals and that we have no immortality, no divine spark. So, a key competency is knowing who and what you are. We forget this when we talk about law. We forget this when we're going to the court that the court, in essence, is claiming its ultimate authority as ecclesiastical, spiritual. So far from this being irrelevant to a parking fine or a criminal case or a threat of jail or the threat of loss of your home, it is square and centre the essential thing that we have to remind ourselves. Knowing who and what you are. You're a spiritual being possessing unique mind expressed in flesh. You're tripartite. You are already a tribunal. And we need to remember these things. You're not simply an animal, a member of the Homo sapiens species. You have a mind and therefore the ability to discern logic, illogic, what is true and what is false. Thanks, Anastasia. A key competency. What is the universe? The oldest civilizations in the world knew that life is a dream. We are speaking today on a land where the custodians of this land as central to their culture for 70,000 years, knew that not only was life is a dream, but that we could connect to that. We could connect to that dream and that the knowledge of how to connect and how to respect that connection was intrinsic to their culture. That is the story of the land of Australia, the story of Dreamtime, Baramban. The universe is amoral, <coughs> not immoral, amoral, meaning, meaning it's neither good nor bad. The universe as a whole, the divine creator as, as a whole. However, the universe will react in favour of free will and resist tyranny. This is an extremely important issue because I assure you the people who architected the world today at the top of the tree, not the trolls, not the mid-ranks, not the bankers who are out of control, but the people who invented the world, the matrix as we know it today, very much understand this principle. And it's why they have survived in power for so long. You'll see in a moment how. You're part of the unique collective awareness, divine creator, and the personification of the divine creator. You are the divine creator. You are the personification of the divine creator. I was asked an excellent question before we started today. The question, roughly, and I want to paraphrase it, was if I know who I am, if I know not what I am, if I am sovereign, if I am the sovereign of my own domain, then why do I need to go through this whole notice process with the Roman cult? The answer is you, you, you don't. If you know who you are, you know what you are, in essence, you, you don't have to prove anything to anybody. Just know that the system, if it doesn't know, is designed to, to grind on because they have such perversions like silence is consent. It was never a, a true law something they invented, science is consent. Ridiculous, but that's what they use. Testing competency. Now this is where we start to switch between knowing who we, what we are and how the system justifies the way it operates. 
again, an essential understanding of Roman law, the self-justification of these people. <coughs> Ridiculous, appalling, but they have a way of doing it. And it is, if you worship in ignorance or ignore perspective, then you declare yourself incompetent. Hence, they place some of their most important signs to us in plain sight. Would you agree with that? Okay. Have you seen this before? <laughs> right. Okay. Well, that is the Oculus Omni. The Oculus Omni, the all-seeing eye of Lucifer. Not Lucifer as a spirit. That's the misdirection. It's a symbol of the Emperor of Rome in 71 CE to 117 CE. It's a symbol now of the Jesuit Superior General as Lucifer, Lord God of Earth from 1534. That's his symbol. That's the head honcho. Okay? And so if you're a 33 degree Mason, you would have a, an understanding of all these different levels, but even that information would be excluded from you. So it's testing competency. If you worship Lucifer or if you worship Lord God, if you go and read the original Greek or the original Latin from which they claim to have created the King James Bible, in the opening sections of the Bible, they do not use the word God or Lord God. That's the English translation. They use words like Elohim, uh, El, El Sabah, different words that do not translate to Lord God. It means something entire, entirely different. Elohim ultimately means a, a, a collection of spirit, or as the Sumerians would say, the Anunnaki, a group, a collective rather than a one. When we speak of divine creator, we're speaking of something far greater than just a God or a Lord God. If you worship something as a Lord God, and knowing what this ultimately is, over here, the Oculus Omni, then you're actually worshipping a man or men as gods. Would that put you in dishonour with the divine, do you think? If you worship other beings as gods rather than worship the, the, the true creator, would that put you in dishonour? Well, that's what they want to happen. They're testing your competency. And 99.99% .99 of the world fail that test. That's exactly what they want. Because it means only they technically are in honour. It's, it's perverse, it's bizarre, it's brilliant. That's why they've been in power for so long. We're going to go through and, and at the end of the last half hour we'll answer questions. So we'll keep going. Money and coin has always been minted in honour of Lucifer from the first millennium BCE because lucky fear, from which we get Loki. Have you heard the word Loki, the god? Yeah, Loki? Lug? That's all lucky fear. It was a Celtic god of good fortune, gold and skill. Always. Money has always been dedicated to lucky fear. And there, they just they put it in plain sight. They put these symbols in plain sight. Testing competency. Public notice versus three will. Has anyone seen The Matrix, the film The Matrix? Yeah. I mean, probably there isn't a, a, a decent conspiracy forum that hasn't mentioned the matrix. <laughs> but what does the matrix tell us? The matrix tells us that the world is an illusion. Your purpose is a source of energy. For an automated system, you are less than a slave. Sound familiar to the real world? Could they have given us a better public notice in the matrix? They even tell you what's wrong with the system in the film. I mean, done in a way that even a 14-year-old child, if they went and saw that, should know what's going wrong with the world. The system is not only automated, it is broken and needs to be rebalanced, yet most people prefer to remain asleep. Have you found that? Yeah. So, public notice. Public notice versus free will. So people want to stay asleep they look at you and say, oh, the matrix is just entertainment. It's got nothing to do with the world. We're all free. This concept of trust, this concept of estates, it's all a myth. Australia is a commonwealth. Australia can't be registered as a corporation with the SEC in America, even though it's on the internet, even though it's right in plain sight. No, 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 I refuse to believe what I see. 
I, I prefer to live in, in ignorance. That's free will. Free will. It's your choice. Have you seen Alice in Wonderland? <laughs> Through the looking glass. Alice, you're a pawn on a chessboard. You're an amusement between elite families. The Red Queen, the White Queen, they were, they were related. They were sisters, weren't they? Elite families until you wake up and, uh, to the fact that you're asleep to reality. So over here, world war, terrorism, recession, crisis, it's all games. It's all games of the elite. Until you stand up and face your demons, you remain at their will. You're just a pawn. Free will. Okay. So where do you start? This is not designed to start any epileptic fits, but it's, it's, it's not, a bad, not a bad image to sort of segue into where do we start. Because it does, you know, the law does kind of create this sickening effect, really, when you try and think of where to start or what to do, or you've read something and you, later on you find that it's not true. The law is deliberately designed to be confusing because it's an occult art. Guess who they lie to first? The lawyers. The first person the law lies to are the lawyers. And then it lies to you. You read their dictionaries, Black's Law, Constant Revisions, the jurisprudence, their case law, thousands and thousands and thousands of pages to find one relevant fact. That's not efficient, is it? You could take all of that and you could present it in a consolidated form. You could take all the law that's ever been written in the world and you could present it in a consolidated form and you could read it. It'd probably be quite large, but you could see it in plain sight. Yeah? But that's not how the law is designed, is it? That's how Yucada law is designed. That's what the canons of Yucada are about. But that's not how. 60, apparently 64 million laws in America now, between the states, the, the local and the federal. 60 million laws in one country. Impossible. Impossible for even one army of people to comprehend that. So we have all these laws. So let's start at the beginning and let's start with the obvious question. What, what does law actually mean? If you want to upset a lawyer, you ask them, what is the law? There you go. Oh, I know what the law is. What is the law? The law is rules, standards, norms, permitting or pro prohibiting certain actions. It, it really is that simple. And it comes from all these different groups. It comes from religion, a little image of St. Peter's here. It comes from legislation, looks surprisingly like St. Peter's, but it's actually the US Capitol building. <laughs> it comes from science and discovery, and it comes from custom, like the Roman cult, the pagan Roman Empire. So laws are claimed to come from many sources, including all of those. That's, that's really, generally speaking, what the law is. Uh, the, the highest laws are canons. And I know that people, when they come to Eucadia and they come to, to read some of the material of Eucadia, get concerned because when they first heard the word canon, the, uh, probably the only context they've heard canon is canon law, the Roman cult, right? That's the most common. If you say canon, canon law, people go, oh, oh the Catholic Church. No, oh, ecclesiastical law, yeah? Well, that's exactly how they want you to think. Why? The highest laws are canons. Why? How? Canons are rules, bar, norms, maxims, measures or standards uncontested. Uncontested. That is a key word in this over time. So if there's a maxim that is used across a range of cultures, bless you, across a range of uh, time periods and it's uncontested, then it is a maxim. More than a maxim, it's a canon. And here we see how canon law is very much a, mas a matter of control. Again, this plain sight. You see the laurel wreath here of SPQR through the Vatican, its keys. See the wreath in the Masons, the wreath in the Senate, and of course the United Nations. It's all in plain sight. The whole system is based on canon law. 
Much of the visible and hidden laws of the world are claimed from Roman law, Vatican law, canon law. Now you know the foundation of law of their system. The root of their system is canon law. Here's a, here's a canon, a maxim. All law is first auricular, spoken. Have you heard that before? So from the beginning of civilization to the present day, all law is still considered spoken into life, not written into life. Now you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that if you went to the magistrate's court <laughs> or parking fines, but the reality is that that law is auricular. And if you think about it, you see signs of spoke, spoken knowledge and the importance of spoken knowledge versus language in all the cultures. Take this land again in Australia. Australia is an example of a high developed culture with the indigenous where the right to know something was done through initiation. And it wasn't that there was an absence of written knowledge their paintings were all forms of writing, as were the Celts in their symbols, all forms of writing. But writing in an alphabetic sense, as we read here, was considered an abomination because it was a way of transmitting something to someone who may have no right to know what it meant. So we see that for thousands and tens of thousands of years, law, the very beginnings of our civilization, comes from this intrinsic canon. And we see it in all the language they use with us. Laws begin as bills which are read. First reading, second reading into Hansard. Monarchs and leaders pronounce laws. Rogatory, rogation, it's all speech. Officials are invested in office after speaking an oath. Yes? Defendants attend and present their defence at hearings. Not readings. <laughs> Court cases are founded on the sacrament of confession. And... The modern legal system may forget this maxim, but it remains paramount that all law is first auricular. Hence, knowing who and what you are is fundamental. Because all the paperwork that you may do, uh, all the remedy that you may subscribe to, may amount to naught in the sense that your day in court or your day of proof may come down to you in this role of speaking. It's not easy. Public speaking is not the easiest thing for people at the best of times. Not in a situation where the whole room is designed to intimidate you. The judge is six foot above you, panels, doors, people with guns. It's all designed to turn you off. But at the end of the day, your strongest weapon in law, once you know who and what you are, is the ability to speak from the heart. That's something they have no remedy against when you do it. Canon. A controversy in law must be resolved. Okay, that's, that makes sense. But what we're saying here is all debts must be paid, all contracts must be honoured, and anyone that brings a controversy before the law, it must be resolved. In other words, where there's smoke, there's fire. If someone has raised something with you, if, if they've raised an issue against you, it's not going to go away. Once it gets clocked into their system, it's not going to go away. It's going to ultimately have to be resolved one way or the other. As much as I would like issues that occur in my life sometimes to go away, we've got to face up and, and, and deal with it. So it is a canon. It's a, it's a fact. So when a controversy is raised, it cannot be ignored. It might be unfounded, unfair, unjust, wrong. But the burden, unfortunately, rests on us to prove the flaws. And I put this here because it's important for us to remember and to encourage you, please, to, if you do, and when you do have the chance, to read what's on One Heaven. Justice is to honour the essence of the living law through due process in rendering judgement, demonstrating fair remedy. So there is such a thing as justice. It does exist, even if we find none of it in the present system. It doesn't mean that it is a false flag. It doesn't mean that it's an illusion. I, I saw this and I just had to put this on because it's <laughs> it really typifies the way the, the system works. A claim not contested stands true. 
silence is consent. A claim brought in law that is not contested or rebutted then stands true, hence silence is considered consent. Do you know that the fundamental reason that people get summary judgments against them is they fail to submit through the procedure of the court any form of rebuttal? I, I know the system is unjust. I know the claims that are unfounded. But if you don't use their procedures and stand there and believe that it is unfounded, you've just given them a free kick. If you want to see the system change, make them work for a living, finally. Make them work. Make them work to show how they justify what they're doing. Don't make it easy for them. And certainly don't allow people to promote systems that uh, make it easy for the system. If you want to make it easy in a magistrate's court or a, or a district court anywhere in the world, it is to uh, ignore this canon. So if one comes to a civil claim against you, you have two choices. Because when you go to that hearing, if the facts claimed by the claimant are not rebutted, then a summary judgment will be rendered, sometimes in five, ten minutes. You either have a counterclaim or you rebut those claims in their forms. If it is a counterclaim, very important. A counterclaim, and I'll, I know this is not directly here, but a very important issue counterclaim. A counterclaim never references their claim. A counterclaim merely presents the facts that may be used in another claim in a contrary manner. In other words, it is using the same events but presenting them differently. And by virtue of that, the judge is forced to make a decision between two claims. If you reference their claim even once, in a counterclaim, then procedurally that claim is thrown out. It's a trick. It's a trick that they've used over and over. So, and warning, disinfo agents. And I say this because I hear this told all the time. Again, there are people who actually, believe it or not, actually are, are out there promoting incompetence. You don't need to learn the law. Just follow my five easy step process to going to jail. It's easy. If you hear people say, you don't have to justify, you don't have to defend, just ignore it. Please, please interrogate that and be very careful about that. If you want the system to change, make them work for it. Don't make it an easy mark. Another canon, authority is hierarchical. The law is hierarchical. It's not surprising that the first culture, the centre of our culture is religion. It actually is one of the first key bedrocks that separate us from pre-civilised cultures to civilised cultures, is to recognise that we are more than what this is. And that, in essence, for want of a better word, is, is religion. So it's, it's unsurprising that divine law is the highest form of canon law. The laws that are allegedly transmitted from some other realm, or sometimes found on gold tablets, <laughs> or stone tablets, uh, but divine law that, that, that speaks of a higher purpose, a higher being, a, a higher way of living. So it's the highest law, followed by natural law. When we mean natural law, we mean the laws of physics, the laws of science, that we are flesh vessels, that I will die, you will die, we will all die eventually. These are natural laws. Interestingly, <coughs> in the last hundred years, you find a brilliant bar people, I bring it lawyers, trying to wiggle a few of these positive laws into natural laws. Have you heard natural person? Well, that's a complete and utter aberration. An absolute perversion. What they're trying to do is say that person, a fiction, is part of the natural kingdom of laws. I mean, ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And positive law, of course, here is then the base. And when we're in positive law, admiralty law, maritime law, administrative law, contract, international, are all forms of positive law at the lowest form of law. Yeah? So do you see, not only is canon the highest form of law, but there's a structure to canon law as well. Making sense? Okay. Here's another canon. 
all property is a right belonging to a trust. It's one of the hardest transitions in imaging to go from the realisation that you don't own the physicality of that car. You ha own a right to use the car, but you can't own it in the sense that you see it as a physical connection to you. <coughs> I know there are some kids around Sydney w would vehemently disagree with me <laughs> that they are physically attached to their cars. But an example here is a house. You can't wrap your arms around your whole house. You can't hold it. And a rule of, of ownership, a rule of possession is if you can't possess it, you can't hold it, then ultimately you can't really own it in that sense. You can own the fiction of the house, the fiction on a piece of paper, the right of use, a title or whatever it is. But you can't own the physical. Because it, we're talking about fictions here, one of the great achievements of the disinfo age of the last 30 years is to put up a giant beware of the dog sign whenever we venture into the world of fiction. Fiction's bad. Fiction's the problem. No, the world is a fiction. Remember life is a dream? We have nothing to fear about fiction. Nothing to fear. Except fear of itself and, and ignorance of how they use that against us. There's nothing intrinsically evil about this concept of the trust. It's only when we don't know how it works and we don't know how they've used it against us. Does that make sense? So in our daily lives, we deal with hundreds of trusts associated with property, whether we realise it or not. And we create them dozens of times during the day. Dad, can I borrow the car? Sure, but don't smash it. Here are the keys. Well, you've just created trust. You've just created trust. Can I, you know, can I borrow your DVD player? Sure, but I need it back by Thursday. You've just created trust. So it's that simple. But because trusts are intrinsic element of the way property as a fiction works, they don't want you to know this. They don't want to know that you to know this because once you start down the path of knowing this, then you start seeing the essence of their structure of financial law, of property law, and what they're doing to you when you ultimately go near their courts. I love this picture. <laughs> The first trust was created in 1302 by the Roman cult. Uh, if you've heard Santo, Santo uh, used a lot of this information that we researched from, um, from uh, Eucadia, and I thank him, for, thank him for getting it out there. Uh, so let's look, at a, let's look at a real trust now, the first trust created in history and how it works. Okay. Uh, if you haven't done it, I really suggest you go and do it. It's a great thing before probably someone takes it down. But this is the official coat of arms of the Franciscans. The Franciscans were created by the Venetians. And the whole history of the Franciscans, including Francis, is unfortunately a huge myth, sadly. Because uh, I kind of liked the story. I thought the animals and that. We are the animals, by the way, if you read the story in Francis. Loving the animals. We were the animals, yeah? Um, but that's their crest and I put that crest up because you know I said and you agreed that they, they make they don't hide the, the, who, who they claim to be in charge or who they are they don't hide it from us they don't need to M most people as we saw in the Matrix film they don't want to know you, you talk to them and say would you like to know they say no don't tell me don't, don't want to know right so they, they have no problems about that if you look at this crest and it's a bit small here that's why I say go and have a look for it. You'll see the three crowns of the three trusts that have created and you have the whole structure there of the, of the uh, Roman cult, the Roman Catholic Church, which they created. And you've even got, if you have a look down here, this is a classic. You've heard of the Jesuits, yeah? You'll hear people saying the Jesuits are in charge of the world. And you might hear, well, who created the Jesuits? Well, the Jesuits were formed in Venice and... The Jesuits are part of the, uh, the, the ruling elite. Well, they've got a flag there. They actually have a flag there, and the flag is the flag of the Jesuits as part of the crest of the Franciscans. They even tell you who's in charge. They even tell you. 
If you hear people on radio and around, they go, oh, no, 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 the Jesuits aren't an order of the Franciscans. Oh, no, the Venetians didn't create the Jesuits. <laughs> they don't hide it. They tell you. So we put them as the executors. The Venetians, through the Franciscan friars, created this trust, and the trust expressed through papal bull, Unum Sanctum, claiming the whole world is subject to the pontiff. The beneficiary are the Christians down here. The trustee is the Roman pontiff. And over here we have the grantor. It's not Jack, it's God. <laughs> God entrusted the earth to the Vatican for safekeeping, yet somehow entrusted his executive powers to Venice. I, I still don't know how that worked out. But uh, that's the first trust. Here's another type of trust, a testamentary trust. So you've obviously heard of a will and testament, yeah? It's one of the few public service announcements that the bar does, or you need a will. They tell you you need a will, don't they? You, you, you know why you need a will? Because if you don't have a will, uh, then you're in probate. What they don't tell you is that you have uh, two, est two estates, effectively, you're creating. A testamentary trust, testamentary estate, and when you were born, they created a, a sister KV trust, a life estate. So unless you structure your will accordingly, that you have these, this life estate and this testamentary estate, then they get you on probate when you die and when you're alive because you haven't given instruction on how all this mess works. They've created a mess and they won't explain to you how to make it work. But they do say you need a will. They don't say how that will works. So a testamentary trust, the form of trust where the testator, you, expresses verbally. Now, was that auricular thing again? That's where the word testamentum comes from. That's what it was. It wasn't called a will. It was called a testamentum in uh, the Roman history, and then memorialised via a testament, so that upon the death, the property is managed accordingly. So you write a will, you pass away, the will says who's the executor, the executor, the trust comes into play, and all your property is in there, the trustee is appointed by the executor, and then there are a set of beneficiaries. Which is why <coughs> in the role of the general executor, you'll hear a fairly feeble response, but Nonetheless, it's a response you might hear. People say, you can't be the general executive because you're not dead yet. Well, that's true for the property that is visible in my estate now. But I have a life estate as well. I have a Sesta KV estate, which you're not letting me see. I know it's there because you give me a birth certificate with my name in all caps. I know it's all there. It's all around me. It's in plain sight, but you just won't admit it's, it's there. You won't tell me the truth. And I can appoint a general executor for that because the judge in court is claiming to be the executor of that estate in my name. Uh, first testamentary trust was created in 1455. So we have some of the usual suspects some new suspects that come onto the chessboard. Here's the pontiff again. So now the pontiff is the grantor, granting rights of use from that wonderful unum sanctum. And then appoints an executor. The executor is the Roman curia, it's the government. So it's the elite roles within the Vatican. The trustees are the College of Cardinals and the beneficiary is the prince over papal land, the first crown. Remember I showed you the that uh, coat of arms of, of Venice, the Franciscans. There's a series of crowns there in amongst the ivy or the olives. Well, that's the first crown created there. Okay, thanks. Second gets created in 1481. Papal bull, attorney regis, eternal crown. Grantor again is the pontiff puts the cure back there. Now we get thrown into the trust. We're the property here. Yeah? So the first one was the land. Uh, that land gets called common land, crown land. Have you heard crown land? Well, that's land ultimately going back up to that first master trust. So trustees again, College of Cardinals. The beneficiary now is the prince over infants. So we're considered infants in their system. Parents Patriae. Have you heard that before? Parents Patriae, the, 
the, the right of the father or the... It's, a, it's an old claim. Basically, it says uh, you're, you're too childish and too stupid to really handle your own affairs because you're an infant. You're a mental infant and so we'll do it for you, for, for your benefit, yeah? Okay, parents patriarch. And here we go, number three. Number three, this is where it gets, this is where it starts to get really weird. This is where they start doing some real occult stuff on us. <coughs> well, I already started, but this gets even worse. So the grantor here is the Pope again, fine. Executives of Roman Curia, trustee college of cardinals. But over here, we have the beneficiary, and the beneficiary is the prince and defender of faith. Now, there was only one defender of faith created, and it was by... By the way, no papal bull you see anywhere on the internet is real. Not one. Every one of them is a fraud, a corruption of the original instrument. You cannot see original papal bulls. I wish they would show us, but the problem of them revealing original true papal bulls, they have one problem is that up until the 18th century, <coughs> the real ones were, were written on human skin. So I think it would be a problem if the Vatican started to reveal documents written on human skin, particularly with DNA to show that it wasn't just human skin, it was the skin of children. So the Prince and Defender of Faith was all about salvation. Salvation is salvaging. Salvaging what? What do you think the most valuable thing to you is to a system that runs on curses, on supernatural? What's the most valuable part of you? Your soul, exactly, your soul. The flesh corrupts, uh, the mind can be manipulated, but what's the one thing that's never incompetent that, that you and we all have? It's our soul, isn't it? So they're after our souls as black magicians. And they invented a concept and they use it as part of the Eucharist. When you go to Mass, what's the, the, the wafers and the, and the wine, what it's, is it supposed to convert into? Right. And there's a word for that. What do they call that word? Transubstantiation. Exactly. So it's a doctrine. Transubstantiation. In other words, something in one physical or spiritual form can shift into another physical or spiritual form. So something physical can, be, can become spiritual or something spiritual can become physical because if you can go one way, you can go the other way, right? Yeah? <laughs> uh, are you aware that they really have this obsession with gold? Yeah? Yeah? Precious, precious. They even do it in public notice. The precious is public notice. They love it, yeah? What do you think the gold is in light of what we just said with transubstantiation? What do you think the gold is representing now in their vaults, in their penitentiaries? People's souls. People's souls. Now, you would have to be on a really big acid trip to think of this kind of stuff, right? <laughs> I mean, these people are off their, they're, they're off their dial. They're off their tree. But they believe it to be the magic. They believe it to be. And this is the foundation of the modern financial system. It truly is. I'll give you an example today. There is a bank. It is the Bank of Banks. Does anyone know that the, the biggest bank, the, the, the bank of all banks is called? Anyone? The Bank for International Settlement, not the IMF. The Bank for International Settlement, the BIS, in Basel, Switzerland, is the bank of all banks. Do you, do you know? It was, okay, it was founded in, in 1931. And it was found, uh, founded with a gold supply that equated to roughly 55,000 to 60,000 tonne of gold. Now, they converted it into Swiss francs. I, I'll show you that the... The, the poor Swiss never turned it into Swiss francs. They'd be minting them f for eternity. 55,000 tonne of gold in Swiss francs? You've got to be kidding, right? No one could produce that many. It, it was gold bars, and it was the gold of the Vatican accrued from blood, war, theft, 
World War II, lie, lie, lie. Okay? Okay. And that, they founded that gold. Now, what they did with that gold was, was quite brilliant. They architected a global recession, a global depression, not unlike the one we're going through at the moment. And so they basically got the banks to call in all the loans that every country, including this one, went bankrupt. And then rather than touching the gold, because the gold was put in place for this global curse system, this modern financial system that has us like ferrets on wheels, slaving away every day, yeah? Is they started writing loans and money against the gold in order to prop people up. And then they instituted a giant system of debt collection, which are called the taxation offices. And they instituted a set of private banks that then were in charge of producing the money supply of those countries, like the Reserve Bank of Australia, a private institution, private shareholders. And then, uh, like ferrets on a wheel, we kept uh, swinging and kept moving. And uh, the corporation structure of the world was put in place as well with the Securities Act of 1933. So the whole modern system came in in that, in that period. But the ideas of this and the legal framework of this was way back in the 16th century. One of the byproducts of this was this idea of another type of trust. So we've done express trust, living trust, we've done testamentary trust, we've seen the, the big ones. And another type of trust is this trust called a Sesta KV trust. And Sesta KV is just a fancy way of saying for the benefit or life of another. That's ultimately what a Sesta KV is. And it's a hybrid. It's a kind of temporary testamentary trust. And its design is that when someone is presumed lost or abandoned, when someone is presumed incompetent, an infant, then a trust could be formed for their benefit and then upon their return or upon the age of majority they could then administer their own affairs. But in the meantime, for the first time in history, the government could get its hands on those assets. So do you see the legal precedent of what a Sesta KV trust did? You see, we take for granted the, the all-reaching powers of the government today. We're born into that society where we, we deal with central governments with extraordinary power. But back in the 16th century, I can assure you, if someone from King Henry's court went down to the, the local shire and said, oh, well, we'll take that farm, there would be an armed standoff there and then, even with the land barons. Because what legal right could the government use to say, well, we're going we're to manage that farm, we're going to take that farm? None. Absolutely none. Until this idea of managing it for your benefit. We'll do it for you because lost and abandoned. Now, we all have abandoned property. We all have abandoned life estates at the moment, managed through the Queen's bench of the uh, court in Australia, so it'd be the Queen's Bench of, uh, probably Queen's Bench of uh, the Supreme Court of New South Wales, probably would be the, the one here in Australia. In America, it's the King's Bench of Philadelphia. There's one court in each country that ultimately are the trustees that handle all this abandoned property. Now, the reason they justify it as being abandoned is you haven't claimed it. You haven't stood up. You, you've accepted everything they've said. You want to be a slave? Sure. Give me a license. You want to be considered a debt, uh, bonded debt? You call me mister. Call me miss. They're called pronomens. Pronomens in Roman history, I spoke about it last night. These pronomens mean something. They mean that you're a debt bond. Mister comes from miser. And miser in Latin, in Roman time, meant you're, you're a bonded debt slave. Sure, call me that. Call me that. Okay, so because the silent majority are quite happy to live that way, they're quite happy to manage the property. They don't claim to own you in that sense of slavery. The corporation's different. The corporation has lost the plot completely and does view as property, 
absolutely views his property, there's no question. But the Commonwealth, the Queen, the overall hierarchy is still claiming it on, as, a, as a service because it's abandoned. So Sester KV, man and woman presumed lost, abandoned, lunatic, incompetent, we'll manage it for you. And the beneficiary may or may not be you. You didn't benefit on the bonds that they produced against your birth, but the government did. You haven't benefited from the other instruments derived from that, but the government did. When uh, you're asked to pay taxes, did you know that the tax is paid twice if you pay it? It's paid twice. Yeah? Because anything that's brought forward in your name is a claim, particularly if it's an institution, against your estate. Okay? It means after 90 days, if it's uncontested, it gets paid by the estate. What you pay, which is often usually the same amount, is cream on top. And there are some famous quotes from America when it was stated, and I, we never understood this, it was stated that income tax derived from the population does not go to general, general revenue, does not go to general revenue. You say to people, how could you do that? I mean, we obviously have money to, to run the country. Otherwise, you know, who pays for the roads? Well, that's all managed through the estate system in the background. That's your estates and the whole state. But the money that you pay, which is the most valuable contribution, is collected by the debt collection agency up to the IMF and back to, you remember that gold and the BIS and those people, the Vatican? Precious, precious, it all goes back to there. And then they work out where they want it to go. And mostly they just hoard it, keep hoarding it, hoarding it, hoarding it. You know they've got accounts on this planet that they could pay the global debt tomorrow and have not just trillions but thousands of trillions left over. The Committee for 300 the well, Council of 300, Committee for 300, there are accounts on this planet that could clear the debt of the world tomorrow. But the people who are in charge are so sick, are so fixated with the precious that they refuse to balance it out. They can balance it out tomorrow. And so they'd rather see it destroyed than do the right thing. That's how sick they are. They will lose everything rather than fix it. That's how mentally ill they are. Let's talk about a state, because a state gets confusing. An estate is a statutory body of a trust. It's a concept created in the 16th century by Henry VIII merely to divide the property of a trust or, or, or divide a, um, yeah, the property of a trust into two basic categories, real property, personal property. So your body is real property, Land is real property, gold or jewellery or clothes, that's all personal property. That's all it is, that's all that a estate is. And an estate is always connected to a trust. They don't tell you that, but an estate is always connected to a trust. And if you want a comparison between a state and corporation, corporation, a corporation it comes from body corporate. And a body corporate really was the property of a trust. So whether you view it as a corporation or whether you view it as an estate is really how you want to split the hairs. But a, an estate is a statutory structure created uh, within UK statutes in treating the property, the body, body corporate, the corporation, in dividing into real and personal property.